Hello everyone, and welcome back to the For the Love Commander podcast. My name is Alex. And my name is Martin. And today we're looking at the Commander 2018 decks. Exciting. But first, we have a quick recap of our predictions video, which... That went well, right? Oh yeah, yeah, we got so many right. Um, so we'll start with me. I predicted there would be transforming cards. Uh, that the Planeswalkers Matter theme would occur. Uh, that the, there would be Planeswalker equipments and auras. Uh, that there would be... Well, I predicted the commanders for the Planeswalkers. Uh, and I predicted that the decks would follow the Shards of Alara, which I got three out of four, right? So I'm going to give myself three quarters of a point for that. So yeah, that's fair enough. Solid start. And you predicted Urza would be there. Uh, Sarah Angel would be there. Uh, you predicted Gauk would come back. Where? And you predicted Colorless decks matter. Uh, Your final prediction was the Nine Titans would return, where you did specifically mention Lord Wingrace. So everyone loves Black Panthers. Ding! You get a point, and a point to three quarters of a point, you win this Woo! prediction game. Um, but I think, but I think you'll agree we both did. Yeah, before. it was terrible. Yeah. Better luck next year. Yeah, let's hope so. It can't be any worse with no. it, can it? So, after that dismal failure, let's get on to our first deck. Yes, so I'll start this off. I'm going to tell you a bit about the Nature's Vengeance deck, which is the Jund, the black, the red, and the green one. Now, the face commander for the set is Lord Windgrace himself. He is too generic, one black, one red, one green, for a five loyalty planeswalker. His plus two ability is discard a card, then draw a card. If a land card is discarded this way, draw an additional card. Pretty solid bit of uh, speeding up the game, card draw. And if you don't have any cards in hand, you can still draw a card off it, even if you don't discard one. So that's not bad. Minus three is return up to two target land cards from your graveyard to the battlefield. Another solid move. It's a land matters deck, so getting a land on the battlefield, really good. And minus 11, destroy up to six target permanents. Sorry, destroy up to six target non-land permanents. Then create six 2-2 green cat warrior creature tokens with forest walk. It's not great. It's not win the game, but it, it can be just kill one person if you really want to. Yeah, if someone's got a forest, they're completely screwed. Um, but the blowing up six permits, that's all that's right. That's pretty solid, yeah. Yeah, it's not bad. I just like him how he comes in, and if you plus him straight away, he's on seven loyalty. That's pretty difficult to get rid of, isn't it? Yeah. Pretty solid commander. Nothing amazing, but they never make the planeswalkers for these decks great because they don't want him seeing playing Legacy and ruining the... Precons, do they? Yeah, they're not, they're not going to be overpowered, but they're trying to find a good balance. Yeah. Um, there are always two alternative commanders in these products as well, so we'll talk a little bit about them. So the first one is Gyrus, or Gyrus, Waker of Corpses. It's X and Jund, and it's a 0 0 Hydra. This card works by having creatures in the graveyard and recurring them. It's a reanimated deck. But you only get the creature during combat, and it's tapped and attacking. I look at this, and people are saying that it's the best commander to be printed in this product. I can see why. It's Reanimator and Jund, a very good combination for that. I have to compare this to Felden, though, because I have my Felden deck. I love my Felden deck. And although Felden's one colour rather than three, he can bring back any creature, regardless of the power and toughness of it is. Yeah. He keeps them around till the end of turn, not till the end of combat. And he sacrifices them rather than have them be exiled. And you can bring back the same creature turn after turn. It doesn't exile when you copy it. Yeah. So, in my head, Felden seems like a much better choice. I can see there'll be people that disagree with me, and that's yeah. completely fine. But I don't know. I think he's, he's, he's great. He uses command attacks for his advantage, which is... Yeah, he scales with command attacks. Um, but uh, I'm not so sure about him. I suppose you can use high-costing cards like uh, Hornet Queen... You can bring that yeah. back for only two power, which is, you know, pretty useful. Um, but I'm on the fence about him. Yeah, he's alright. And the other one is Stantis the War Weaver, which is a 6 mana 5-5 five, five Vigilance Reach that makes all creatures attack if able. And whenever a creature attacks you or a Planeswalker, you put a plus one plus one counter on Thantis. I mean, it's a deterrent from stopping people from attacking you. Um, it gets big very quickly, I would imagine. It, it's good for chaos, that's... About it. Yeah, but why is it in this deck? Not a clue. Um, and that's what I find about a lot of these cards that it's like, oh, it's a land matters deck, but only about a third of it is, and then a third of it is reanimated, and a third of it is I don't even know. Yeah. Um, but hey, 
it's a solid card. You could build around it, I suppose, yeah, if you really wanted to. Maybe Tribal Spiders or Family yeah. Commander. Overall, I do like the deck. It's got a lot of ramp in it, like an insane amount of ramp. Yeah. So you're going to be ahead of everyone else playing, which is beautiful. But it only has about eight cards of landfall in it, which isn't enough for me. I want to tear this deck apart the second I get it and throw in some cards that should have been in it. For example, Omnath Locust of Rage, the Gitrog Monster, Titania, Obnix List. It's just so many cards that could go in that have landfall. And I think it'll be much better um, to think of it as a baseline deck that you need to grow rather than being the complete thing out of the packet. But overall, I think it's great. It's got a couple of really nice reprints, so Avenger of Zendikar and uh, Bedorka Gardener, the flippy over one. Oh, the flippy over one. Yeah, it's nice to see him. Uh, some of the new cards are really nice as well. The Turn Timber Sower, that is going to be beautiful. Um, the Crash of Rhino Beetles, which is a bigger version of Scoot Mob, love that. Nesting Dragon's a great landfall card. Whip Tongue Hydra is going to be funny. Not so much in this deck, I think I'll stick it out and put it in Merin, but it's going to be hilarious. It's a good card. It's been a progress for Flyers. Xantia, Sleeper Agent. It's one that's going to come out for me because it's not land related, but it's a hilarious card. It's going to have so many people brewing around it. I'm sure there'll be some fun to have there. Um, one thing that I've noticed about the deck as well is that the land base is very solid. In fact, that could be said for all the decks. The land base is great. I'm barely going to touch it. No, it's probably fine, yeah. Yeah, um, which is nice that um, you don't have to spend lots yeah. of money on, on your mana. <laughs> Even giving the bad fetches. Bad fetches, yep. Uh, well, slow fetches. Slow. Not on back. Um, and um, it's got some of the bounce lands as well, which in a pinch you can play bounce and then play again next turn for a landfall trigger. So. Or you can use them to bounce a land and then plus one rune grace to discard the land. Yeah, yeah. So it's got some really cool mechanics in there. It's very synergistic, even if it is a bit all over the place. Yeah. Moving on to our second deck, Subjective Reality, which is headed by my new personal bay, Aminato the Fate Shifter. Mm, who creepy one, right? She's not creepy, she's just misunderstood. She's in a swamp surrounded by moths, That's pr- and there's like a little eight-year-old girl. That is pretty creepy. Have you not seen You've been watching horror too films? much <laughs> Japanese horror films. <laughs> she is, for one white, one blue, and one black, a three loyalty planeswalker with plus one, draw a card, then put a card from your hand on top of your library. Yeah. I, I like drawing cards. Minus one, exile on the target permanent you own, then return to the battlefield under your control. So, flickering something, or if your opponent's decided to control magic something of yours, get it back. Yeah, that's the best part about a permanent you own, not control. Yeah. So, they will never be able to steal your things. Or just flickering something of high yeah. value. I, I like double noxious gearhawk triggers, who doesn't? <laughs> and her minus six, choose left or right. Each player gains control of all non-land permanents other than Amanyato the Fate Shifter, controlled by the next player in the chosen direction. I don't like that ultimate at all. I feel like it's very situational. It's exceptionally situational. The best case scenario is that you and the person diagonally from you have nothing, and you get to switch it up and make an alliance. Or you can just annoy everyone else at the table, which is not great. Yeah, because the second you steal someone's board state, they're going to do their best to kill you so they can get it back, which is not good for you, no. unless you can kill them faster, in which yeah. case you lose your board state because they're dead. So it's, it seems like it's very chaotic. It's interesting. I'll see yeah. how I play. I'll see if I ever actually do the minus. <laughs> And the other commanders for the deck, we have Yurt Cryptic Sovereign. For two generic mana, one white, one blue, and one black, she is a 3-5 Flying Vigilance Menace. Lots of words there, I like it. With, whenever this card attacks, reveal the top card of your library. If that card's converted mana cost is odd, you may cast it without paying its mana cost. Otherwise, draw a card. I love this card. It, yeah. It's on attack, not deal combat damage, even though it's got Menace. It's got good evasion, it still has vigilance, so you can still swing, get the value and not lose a blocker. It's card... I, I really like it. I like the fact that you may cast the card, so yeah. if it's a not the correct time to do it, you go, nope, I'll draw that instead and save exactly. for later. If, if you reveal an end hostilities, you don't want to be casting that mid-combat with your net out, so you can just draw it and save it for later. Our last one is Varina Lich Queen, whom... She's a solid Esper Zombie Tribal Commander. Yeah. Not entirely sure why she's in my deck. 
Well, you know, there, there are multiple themes in a deck. They're not uh, all supposed to be synergistic. It doesn't seem like there's many zombies themselves in here. Though, there is... Um, capitalise on it. There's this card and the flashback zombie card where you get 13 two, two tapped zombies. Yeah. There's that and her. So she's a solid card. Not sure why she's here, but she's a solid, perfectly fine card. Now, moving on to the actual deck. Initially, I didn't really like the list. It, it seemed very all over the shop. It seemed like it wanted to be top deck matters, flicker, zombie, ninjas, not really knowing what it wanted to be. But after actually looking at it, it actually really does fit much better with top deck matters themes. For example, we've got every single miracle possible in Esper Colors being printed in there, apart from Temporal Mastery and Vanishment, which I can perfectly understand why wizards don't want to print a two mana take an extra turn in a commander product. Oh yeah. And then equally, they've even printed a new miracle card with Entreat the Dead, which is fantastic card. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's Entreat I, the Angels, but the opposite. It's, it's, I, I would happily play this over Entreat the Angels. Someone said you can only play one of these cards, I would take Entreat the Dead. Ooh, do you think that that'll impact Legacy with the Entreat the Angels deck that's out there? Probably not, because their de our deck's entirely based around just playing Miracles. It doesn't really pitch stuff to its grave all that much. And also, Top Tricks got banned. Yeah, that's true. So, beyond that, it still has... One of the main mechanics of the deck is manifesting and making sure you can manifest the correct thing. Or, if you want to bounce something back, you have the two cards with Ninjutsu that can return a card to your hand if it's manifested. Ooh, I've just thought as well, your commander can flicker something yeah, so it flips it face up. Yes, yeah, so if you've manifested something that has a really high mana cost and you can't quite pay it, I'll just flicker instead. That's really good. And looking at just the figures for the deck, there are quite a few cards that do in fact manipulate the top card of the library, with some being payoff cards for it. We have 12 fixing cards for it, like Telling Time, Brainstorm, or Crystal Ball, and 15 cards for the payoff of it, such as Yunette herself or Conundrum Sphinx. And also circling back just for a second, to the manifesting mechanic. We now have the new card, Primordial Mist, that I know Gar Gavin was very happy with. The fact that you can now exile any manifests you have that were face down and then cast them, there've always been that time and the problem with manifests where you play a card, a spell that you really wanted to cast, but you can't because it's not a creature. Now you can. And it's also creature advantage as you can manifest the top card of your library every turn. So it's Whisperwood Elemental, but better. It's also not a creature, it's an enchantment. Yeah, but it's, it's harder to destroy. Yeah, it's a lot It's a lot nicer, it has a lot more versatility to it. And you can do that any number of times during your turn. <laughs> the line base is solid, it includes a few cards that do alter the top of your library, even the even one of the um, single colored Scrylands. Personally, I think the deck is still really solid. It could have had a bit more push for the top deck theme, for example, it could have included Clash cards, which I thought could have been a great idea. Oh yeah, I never even thought about that. So we've got stuff like Pollen Library could have been in there, just as an example. But overall, I feel like the zombie thing with Lich Queen was a bit of a missed opportunity. That could have been instead a good flicker target. <clears throat> Grave Titan. <laughs> the reprints in it are nothing to write home about. There's Entreat the Angels. That's about it. Everything else is sort of mingling at $3 with Ponder, Terminus, or Silent Blade Oni. I suppose if you've been wanting to make a Miracles-related deck for a while, oh, yeah. you can get is, a lot in there. This is now... There are only a few cards with Miracle, but this is where they fit in nicely. But overall, still a very consistent deck, and it very much does have the theme that I wanted in the deck, of the top of your library mattering and having power within the game. So the next deck is the Exquisite Invention deck, led by Sahili the Gifted. She is two, a blue and a red for a four mana planeswalker with plus one, create a one one colourless server artifact creature token. Not bad, planeswalkers that can protect themselves. Yeah. yeah. Um, her other plus one, because who needs a minus, is the next spell you cast this turn. It costs one less to cast for each artifact you control as you cast it which is incredibly good for chasing out big things. It's not even the next artifact you cast, it's the next spell you cast. Everyone loves a turn five blight still Colossus. Ooh. But the only downside to this is you activate that and then it's the next spell you cast where it counts the yeah. uh, the artifact. So if someone says plus one's healer to do this, and then in response someone blows up all the artifacts, they never disc or whatever, yeah. then you're going to have the issue of the next spell you cast... Still no matter what it is. Still cost its regular CMC. Yeah, so that's a bit of a shame, but you can't have... It's a powerful mechanic, you can't it have is. everything. Yes. 
And her final ability is minus seven, which isn't actually that difficult to do with her, considering no. she comes in on five. You can't negate it. You can't turn it no. down. Uh, and has protection. Yeah, she makes well. protection for herself. So minus seven is for each artifact you control, create a token that's a copy of it. Those tokens gain haste, exile them at the beginning of the next end step. It'd be fine about that final line, but I can see why they've done it. She's too easy to ultimate. Yeah. And same as the past two commanders, it's not an amazing ultimate, but... No. If the, to- if the token stayed around, yes, but... Yeah, it's 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 okay. I think she's a fine commander. She's going to find a place in the 99 in my Breya deck. Yeah. But she is perfectly fine if you want to go big artifacts. Just put a few mana rocks in, bang out that huge artifact feature by turn five. Really nice. The alternate commanders that you can have for this deck are Brudiclad Telcor Engineer, which is four generic, a blue and a red for a 4-4. Four, four. I love this card. It gives all tokens you control haste, regardless of whether they're in artifacts or not. And at the beginning of combat on your turn, create a 2-1 blue mer artifact creature token. Then you may choose a token you control. If you do, each other token you control becomes a copy of it. So once again, doesn't really care about artifacts that much. I would, if I was making this deck, and I do really like this deck, is scrap all the artifact theme and make it just a pure tokens theme. So you could play treasures, you could play clues, you could play, I don't know, servos or thopters, anything that makes a lot of things. Then you cast a big creature, such as... Desolation Twin. Desolation Twin. Um, so then you have a 10-10. All your treasures, clues become... Ten tens. Or alternatively, you can do the other thing where you stick the blue enchantment, which says if you have seven or more of the same thing, you win the game on anything that's a token, yeah. and then make Instant everything win. that. So uh, it seems very, very powerful. I really do like this. And the giving tokens haste is crazy anyway. And speaking of haste, the final commander is very hasty. It's Tornos Urza's Apprentice. I apologise for butchering these names, by the way. I've never been very good at pronouncing magical names. Uh, but it's just a blue and a red for a 1-3. Haste with blue-red. Tap. Copy target activated or triggered ability you control from an artifact source. You may choose new targets for the copy. This is going to be the stacks commander for this deck. I can yeah. see a lot of people buying this deck for him and nothing else. Let's say you have Etherflux Reservoir. You now kill two people instead of one in one turn. And the fact that he has haste is great. If you haven't played him yet, but you've got four mana open, slam him out, activate him the same turn. If they don't have instant speed removal, you there's me- nothing they can do. You merely get an additional valuable trigger. And I feel there's going to be a lot of shenanigans with him as you can copy abilities. So let's say, for example, the new card, Retrofitter Foundry, that has a three mana on tap. You can abuse this with enough mana. You can tap it for an ability... Untap it, use him to copy the untap. Whilst the second untap's on the stack, tap it again, untap it. You can do some crazy things with this, um, and I'm sure someone will break it very quickly. easily. With regards to the deck itself as a whole, I feel it's a lot more streamlined than the previous two we've talked about. Yeah, it knows what it wants to be. It's artifacts, can't go wrong with that. No. even the fact that one of them was tokens as a commander didn't they're really still, say They're still thing. token artifacts. Yeah, he makes artifacts. He himself is an artifact. Yeah. It's very good. Uh, there's a couple of noticeable reprints, but nothing too exciting. We've got Duplicant and Unwinding Clock. That's kind of a lot for value. Yeah. There's nothing in there worth too much, which isn't really an issue. You get It's more than your value if you paid for the deck. Mm. Uh, but some of the new cards are great. We've got the Retro Fitter Foundry, as I just mentioned. Sahili's Directive, which is Red Genesis Wave for Artifacts. I love this card. That's beautiful. And it also has Improvise, so you can tap your Artifacts to cast it. Yeah. Uh, we've got the Dolkin Humiliator. Nothing to do with Artifacts, but I just love this card. Yeah. Make all your opponent Because it's not even the, the opponent you attack, it's all opponents. Yeah, it's just... So if you have a way of making their things small at all, you just get minus one, minus one. You board wipe yeah. when you attack, which is phenomenal. Uh, so I'm sure he'll find his way into some crazy yeah. shenanigans of Elish Norm at some point. We also have Varchild, Betrayer of Keljo. Um Another card that's going to have decks focused around it. It's hilarious. It's going to have some really fun interactions with all cards. Yeah. Uh, it'd be great to see how people build that. And Treasure Nabber, the, uh, the goblin, oh, which gosh. deals artifacts when they're tapped for mana. So, worst case scenario, you steal someone's soul ring for a turn and give it back. Yep. Not bad. 
Best case scenario, you play the lattice that makes everything an artifact, you steal everything that they do. Uh, every, 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 every land they tap for mana, you steal it temporarily. It's going to be a fun Te- card. Temporarily? You're thinking too small. Why not just end my own turn with the trigger on the stack? Oh, so now I think of that's how I love you. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's going to be a hilarious little card to stick in that no one will really take seriously until it ruins them. Put, put it in Felden. Put it in Felden, yeah. Uh, but that's about it for this deck. It's solid. It's simple. It's. I thought it was going to be the worst of the four by far, being only two colours. Yeah. It's not. It's quite a strong deck. Yeah. We go to our fourth final deck, and I know Amanyato is Bay, but this is my favourite deck. Adaptive Enchantment, who is currently headed by our leading planeswalker, Estrid the Masked. She is, for one generic, one green, one white, and one blue, a three loyalty planeswalker with plus two, untap each enchanted permanent you control. Very powerful. Especially with the amount of cards in her, like, Wild growth, overgrowth, and fertile ground. Oh, and tapping all your land. Yeah. yeah. Just, uh, I would like a free planeswalker, please. Minus one, create a white aura enchantment token named Mask, attached to another target permanent. The token has enchant permanent and totem armor. Beautiful mechanic totem armor. Yeah. When you want to double protect something, totem armor is a fantastic mechanic because it essentially solves the problem of auras that if a creature dies, You've just gotten two for one. Yeah. But this solves that beautifully. Um, yeah, and it's one of those things where if you do have your win con or a big creature, you can stick Totem Armor on it every turn and there yeah. is no chance it is going away. And then her minus seven, put the top seven cards of your library into your graveyard, return all non aura enchantment cards from your graveyard to the battlefield, then do the same for aura cards. I think that's the best ultimate of all these planeswalkers. Absolutely. This. This is what I like my Planeswalkers Ultimate to do. It's pretty much, I won the game now, which I very much like. I would very much like my Planeswalkers Ultimate to be a replenish, a $108 card. And I like the fact that she may only come in on three, but she plus twos. She plus so twos. Comes in, three, plus straight away you're on five, plus again next turn you're on seven. Yeah, That's it's three the, turns before it, you can use yeah, your ultimate. It's, it's the usual pl- three turn for it, which is fine. She doesn't protect herself, but the yeah, deck she is... she can't tow some armor herself. Yeah. Oh yeah, she can. <laughs> No, she can't see it. It's another permanent. But I have read in the rulings you can find ways to move Totem yeah, Armor you can to do. her. So if you but, do find a way, please let us know in the comments yeah. if you know of <laughs> any. Um, you can keep her alive forever. And then the the other commander for the deck is Kestia the Cultivator. For one generic mana and Bant, she's a 4 4 legendary creature nymph with Bestow. With three generic mana and bant, enchanted creature has plus four plus four, and whenever an enchanted creature or enchantment creature you control attacks, draw a card. Hmm, very so powerful. She is. She's a draw engine in bant. She's a good buff. You still have to pay the command attacks, even if you bestow her, though. Just a rem- reminder of that. But she's definitely more of a ninety nine for me than a commander. Yeah. But she's very, very good. I enjoy her a lot. My only gripe with her is the way she's worded. If you have an enchantment creature that is enchanted that attacks, you only draw one card, yeah. which seems like a bit of a letdown to me. I'd rather it be separate triggers, draw more cards. Potentially, but I think with this deck and the enchantresses that we have available to us, you'd, you'd end up decking yourself. Oh yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of enchantments, especially the new one that's say to add into the collection as yes. well. That's got to be at, what, at least eight different types of enchantress a few yeah and moving on to our last one and the one that's probably going to head my personal deck tuvasha the sunlit a bant one one merfolk shaman hey you finally got the one you were asking for bant merfolk commander (laughs) pity she does nothing to do with merfolk nothing to do with merfolk at all but it's still there it it, it's something (laughs) tuvasha the sunlit gets plus one plus one for each enchantment you control and whenever you cast your first enchantment spell each turn, draw a card. Yeah, it's not quite um, drawing a card for each enchantment you play. It's not an enchantress as such. No, but ha- essentially you draw two cards a turn at the least. Yeah. It's always good. And scaling with the amount of enchantments you have mm. will be insanely quick. The thing I like her most about her is the fact that she gives you different routes for your deck. She can either just be a nice value engine, or she can lend you more to Voltron strategies in the later game. Which is something I always like, is decks that don't just have, I win by this route and this route only, it's being able to change of your game plan. It's, this hasn't worked, right, I'm now going to try and 21 you with Tuvasa. 
And if you have your planeswalker out and you totem armor, as well as a buff, it makes it more difficult for them to get rid of her. Synergies. Synergy. The deck is overall, I would say it's on par with the artifact one. It knows what it wants to be. It's enchantments. Yeah, it's it's auras, it's enchantments. Yes. It has a good amount of totem armors, as well as cards that benefit from playing and just having enchantments on board, like Ajani's Chosen or Yamamaya's Enchantress. Good new cards are Estrid's Invocation, Everwatching Eye, and Ravenous Slime. Estrid's Invocation is just, it's a very much whatever you want me to be <laughs> card. I love it. You want a double Karmic Justice? Yes, you do. You want a double Enchantress Presence? Of course you do. And Everwatching Eye is just card draw, and Ravenous Slime has absolutely nothing to do with enchantments, but I do love any card that hates out Meryn. No. In the deck, there are a few reprints more than most others. There's the Enchantress's Presence, which is a nice reprint. I didn't realize it jumped that much. And Bear Umbra. But that is, unfortunately, about it. Overall, as I said, it's probably my favorite deck and can be easily tuned up with a bit of help from Theros. But there's not a lot else to say. The lands are fine, as with all of them. And I wasn't expecting Sarah's Sanctum to be reprinted. <laughs> Would be nice, though. Yeah. So, now we've said our part about the four decks, I think we need to address the... Elephant in the room. Yeah. The charging elephant in the room. <laughs> um, most people that have seen the deck lists have gone, they're not as good as previous years, or they've not got the cards in you want. Um, I mentioned with the Lord Wingrace, there's no Omnath, there's yeah. no Gitrog. Easily inclusions in the deck, they would, they're not expensive cards. Mm. But people are wondering why there was no Sensei's Divining Top in Yamanato, no Worm Coil Engine in the Token deck, no Azusa in the Lance Matter deck, and no Thassor Asceticism in the Enchantment deck. Now, whilst these would be nice, the decks are still more valuable than their MSRP, but these reprints are important because they, they do need to be made accessible to people that are just going to go out and buy the cards singularly. Casual Kitchen Table Commander players who these products are also for, aren't going to be cracking boxes of master sets to find a top or a Zeusa. Now I've got the opposite view of you on there. I agree these are casual decks, they're for newer players. They're not, this is the best deck, go out and buy it and have it. I think having cards like Oracle of Moldaya in there, or to a lesser extent, say Crucible of Worlds, top, people would buy the products for the value and it'd be less accessible to players. I would view these not as complete decks. I would see them more as starting points with three or four directions to go for. Um, so let's take your Esper one. You could do Top Deck Matters. You could do Zombies. You could do Ninjas. Here's the basis for you with the land base. Go out and make it your own. So I think where, as in previous years, it was quite set in stone what you did. These, I think, will see more variety with people playing them. As I say, it's perfectly fine and does the important thing where the decks themselves still are accessible to people. People can now, who have more casual variety, can pick up these decks, have a focused and accessible way to get into Commander, and over the years, tune them up and go out and play with their friends, and definitely have a, a lot better stepping stone than just piling the cards they've collected together with a commander. Yeah, and I think I just mentioned before, they're not bad value for money. They're no. all about a hundred dollars of win rates being about eighty. They're definitely more than MSRP. Yeah. Um but what I think hurts these decks the most is the power of the previous two years worth of decks. You talk about Atraxa and Brea, they were fantastic. Mm -hmm. You go back so you've got last year you've got Edgar, who both Edgar and Brea had been banned in one on one commander. They were two good decks. Whereas this year they've gone a bit more safe, I feel. They've gone but, back to the same yeah. power level as the usual. But so. they're still very good commanders. Yeah. There's cards in there that get you started. That's the point yeah. I'm trying to drive home. So, it's not the best deck ever. Yeah. It's a good starting point. They are solid. We'll go with 6 out of 10. I think 6 is a reasonable score, yeah. yeah. So, our big takeaway. The reprints would have been nice. They're not the end of the world. And overall, Commander 2018 is fine. And you never know what's around the corner. There might be a reason they haven't printed these cards. Um, maybe there'll be a Commander Masters or something similar coming soon. Well, they did. That was called Battle Bond. They, they did. Uh, maybe they have learned from their yeah. mistakes and are going to fix Masters sets uh, with, uh, with what they've done there. We're going to get all the decks. We think they're good. We think there's a lot of potential in there. And I think it just takes a bit more creativity than previous years to find that. 
And once people do find it and share their ideas, I think we'll have some really interesting games with them. Well, that's it for this episode of The Love Commander. Thank you for watching, and thank you to everyone for sharing, liking, and subscribing the videos thus far. We've reached over a thousand subscribers now, which will next week be our thousand subscriber special. Which was a very fun game to play, if not infuriating to try and narrate. <laughs> and that'll be all we're going to say about it. So don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and follow us on Twitter, at 4 and we will see you next time.